In today's video, we are going over an evidence-based guide to cervical radiculopathy. Let's do it. So why are we going over cervical radiculopathy? Well, for one, neck pain is going to be very, very common for your patients. However, cervical radiculopathy is not that common. When patients have cervical radiculopathy, it's extremely scary. You have these shooting pains going down the arm, numbness, tingling, paresthesia. Um, and then when they go to the doc, the doc's like, you've got a pinched nerve. It's extremely scary. And I think because of this, from a treatment perspective for a physical therapist, we're not exactly sure how to treat it because we don't see it that often. We're not sure if we should treat it differently. And generally speaking, it is treated a bit differently than generic neck pain. The other reason why I'm covering cervical radiculopathy is because you guys asked me to do it. So I want to go very in depth on this topic today. So we just have a lot of stuff to go over today. We're going to go over the prevalence, the history, the clinical presentation prognosis, natural history, predisposing risk factors, anatomy, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and lastly, treatment. And now I've got a free guide for you today. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet to cervical radiculopathy. We go over all the fundamental basics for diagnosis and treatment of cervical radiculopathy. It's an eight page PDF, and I'll take you from a novice to an expert extremely quickly. I'm gonna leave a link in the description so you can go ahead and download that right now and get learning. And lastly, this cheat sheet was specifically made for the lesson today. So I have all of the bullet points in this presentation included in the cheat sheet. And this is really nice. So if you download it, you can follow along with today's lesson. And the other piece is that a couple months from now, if you're like, ah, oh, man, I kind of forgot what Dan said about cervical radiculopathy. You have a new patient coming in tomorrow and you want to make sure you do a good job. You can just take a look at the cheat sheet, reference it, and just nail your examination. So what is cervical radiculopathy? Cervical radiculopathy is a neurologic condition in the cervical spine characterized by true neurological loss. Now, what is true neurological loss? That could be a change in sensation, that could be a change in reflexes, or it could be a change in myotomes. Radicular pain, on the other hand, is going to be pain originating from a compressed dorsal root ganglion or inflammation of that nerve due to a variety of mechanisms. What's important to understand is you can have radicular pain without radiculopathy. So if you don't have a true neurological deficit, that wouldn't be a true cervical radiculopathy by definition. But if you have pain coming from that nerve root due to inflammation or compression, that would be radicular pain. What's also important to understand is that compression of the nerve root alone is not enough to create pain. There has to be some inflammation as well. And we'll talk about this a little bit later as to when this happens. However, compression by itself can create some of these neurological conditions we just talked about before. I just think from a patient education standpoint, talking a little about compression, how compression doesn't lead to pain immediately is probably helpful for the folks you're working with. So what is the prevalence of cervical radiculopathy? It's actually quite a bit lower than other pathologies you work with as a physical therapist. So you're going to see 1.21 to 5.8 injuries per every 1,000 uh, persons. And this is about 0.5% of folks. If we compare this to something like lumbar radiculopathy, three to 5% of all folks are going to end up getting this. So the same condition in the lumbar spine is much, much more common than in the cervical spine. And if you compare this to something like low back pain, around 80% of the population is going to get this over the course of their life. So cervical radiculopathy, obviously very scary. As a physical therapist, you're going to be treating it if you treat necks for long enough, but it's going to be much less common than lumbar radiculopathy or something like low back pain. So which areas of the cervical spine are most susceptible to radiculopathy? Well, what I will say first and foremost is I've seen different numbers from different research studies. So what you hear right now might be a little different than what you learned, right? If you guys want to check out the uh, references, I've included all of them in the show notes. So at any point, if you're like, I'm not sure where Dan got this information from, there's going to be a cor uh, corresponding citation so you can check it out. So the C7 nerve root is most commonly injured followed by the C6 nerve root, followed lastly by the C8 nerve root. And the prevalence of you hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel is way lower than I'd like it to be. So go ahead and hit that like button now and continue on. So what's the prognosis or natural history of cervical radiculopathy? Basically, does this get better over the course of time? Do we need to imply some exercises to make it better, right? Uh, over the course of five, 10, 15 years, are these folks gonna continue having weakness for the rest of their life? So generally speaking, 70 to 95% of patients with cervical radicular pain will significantly improve with conservative treatment. So what the heck is conservative treatment? I think the first 
piece is time. We tend not to think that time is a big part of conservative treatment. Uh, largely, folks will get better just with the passing of time. Your body's pretty dang good at healing things within your body. The other piece is going to be some sort of exercise therapy. Usually, this is physical therapy. We'll talk about what constitutes exercise therapy a little bit later in this presentation. Anti-inflammatory drugs, so essentially NSAIDs taken orally, can be something that's conservative. And the last one is going to be an epidural corticosteroid injection. These are all considered conservative treatments, and most folks are going to get better over the course of time with either nothing or some of these easy treatments. So in folks that are untreated, so essentially if you don't do physical therapy, no uh, steroid injections, no NSAIDs, what happens? Well, substantial improvements are found in 83% of patients with cervical radicular pain due to disc herniation four to six months after the onset of pain. Now, it is important to understand that this is with patients that have had a disc herniation, which is a little bit different than other forms of radicular pain. Uh, however, this is some hopeful news. In this same study, the time to complete recovery was around 24 to 36 months in most patients. So despite most patients getting better very rapidly, so in the first few weeks to months, folks feeling quite a bit better, it actually does take a substantial period of time for people to get all the way back to the baseline and feel back to normal. The other piece is that 22% of these patients had a recurrence that they reported as moderate, right? And this recurrence of pain wasn't as bad as the initial exacerbation, but along this healing journey, you're going to find some folks kind of get a little worse, get a little bit better. And then as they're getting better, they get a little flare up, not as bad as initially was, but that's all normal. And it's part of the rehab process. Radhak Krishnan et al. found that at a four-year follow-up, nearly 90% of patients with cervical radiculopathy were either asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic. So it's pretty dang nice. Over the course of a few years, most people are right back down to the baseline feeling pretty good, only some mild symptoms, if any. The other thing that's important to understand, and we'll talk about this more in depth later, is you can have cervical radiculopathy from a disc herniation, but it can also occur due to degenerative changes within the spine, right? And this same study found that there was no significant difference between having a disc herniation or degenerative changes, so something like an osteophyte complex, um, as a cause of radiculopathy and long-term outcomes associated to getting better. So if you have a disc herniation or you have degenerative changes over the course of time, these both tend to get better at a similar rate. One of the biggest concerns with patients after they have a disc herniation is that they want to know if this disc is going to heal over the course of time. Well, there's something called disc resorption, which basically means that the, the disc can shrink back closer to its normal size over the course of time. Will these discs resorb over time? And the answer is mostly yes. So half of cervical disc herniations decrease within six months. About three quarters will decrease by more than 50% within two years, right? So again, this seems like it can take quite a bit of time for healing to occur or resorption to occur. The other piece to understand is that if you have cervical radiculopathy over the course of time, generally your symptoms will get better, but doesn't mean that your disc has to resorb or resorb quickly. So you can actually have decreased symptoms much more quickly than disc resorption. And in some cases, you have no disc resorption, but the majority of symptoms get better over the course of time. Now, I think this is pretty confusing for patients and for physical therapists too. Like if you have a disc herniation that doesn't resorb, then how come your symptoms go down? There is usually in, uh, excuse me, inflammation that occurs with a disc herniation. And over the course of time, this inflammation can go down. So it's just, despite there being some uh, mechanical compression, of the disc up against the nerve doesn't mean you're just bound to have a ton of pain. It may have been the inflammation that was driving that in the first place. The other piece is that in the intervertebral foramen where those nerves live, there's quite a bit of space. So if you have a disc herniation and it's big enough, it might start to press up against that nerve a little bit, create some symptoms. And then over the course of time, as there's some resorption, it might be enough to decrease the compression and now the nerve feels A-OK. -okay, and you'll still find a smaller disc herniation via MRI, but it's small enough that it's creating no symptoms, right? If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the Fitness Pain-Free Mini Course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now, I'm actually a really big fan of education, and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want, which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, 
bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal with the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important they understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better, they go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, Rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seat of reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me. Tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. The second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later. So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. And now back to your learning. What are some predisposing risk factors for the development of cervical radiculopathy? Well, for one, if you're older than 40, that increases your risk. The reason being is that the majority of folks that get cervical radiculopathy, they get this via degenerative changes within the spine. You're usually not born with degenerative changes, right? So with the passage of time, you have more and more degenerative changes, which can cause cervical radiculopathy. Also being a woman increases your chances. Sorry, ladies, uh, white race, same thing. Cigarette smoking, absolutely ter terrible for you for a variety of reasons, right? Having a prior lumbar radiculopathy increases your risk of a future cervical radiculopathy. So maybe some of the, th the same things that are creating a lumbar radiculopathy are also potentially leading to cervical radiculopathy. And lastly, trauma can be one of the things that can create cervical radiculopathy. However, the instance of trauma preceding the onset of cervical radiculopathy is relatively low. And up to 30% of patients report the onset of pain when sitting, walking, or standing. Right. And I think this becomes very confusing for patients they are like, well, I wasn't really doing anything. And then I had this, you know, intense onset of neck pain. What the heck is going on? Why would that happen? Uh, it's actually quite common, right? One third of patients, that's the onset. Right. Uh, and I've certainly seen patients that maybe hit their head, got into a car accident. Maybe they dropped the barbell on their neck and they immediately have, <clears throat> excuse me, radiculopathy symptoms. But keep in mind that these can just can occur over the course of time with relatively benign activities. And that's also normal. So I really wanted to mention this because it's a, it's enormous finding and it's a bit of an elephant in the room when it comes to neck pain in general, and also for a multitude of different injuries within the body. But I think for low back pain, as well as neck pain, you'll find that some of these psychological risk factors are very, very strong in their correlation between the onset and perpetuation of symptoms in folks that have neck pain, low back pain. Uh, this is not in the cervical radiculopathy literature, but I figured I would mention it. The other thing to keep in mind is that these parameters haven't been studied really well in cervical radiculopathy, but they have been studied pretty well in neck pain. So I'll just stop talking and get onto it. So what psychological risk factors increase your chances of getting neck pain? Long-term stress, a lack of social support, anxiety, and depression are important risk factors for neck pain. So these are things we don't often think about as physical therapists or patients. Patients might think, oh, it's my posture. I'm not in a great position, or I'm spending too much time sitting, right? I'm watching too much TV, or I'm 
texting too frequently, right? Uh, and these may be things that potentially correlate to pain, although posture doesn't have a great correlation with the onset, uh, excuse me, onset of pain, right? But some of these psychosocial uh, factors are much more important in the development of neck pain. And I also think that for folks who are trying to stay pain free for the long haul, right, and get out of pain, trying to address some of these symptoms is probably going to be important. The next one I want to chat about is going to be sleep. Uh, sleep is an amazing thing we're starting to learn more and more about. And it seems like it's important for every aspect of our health, including pain and injuries. And if we're not sleeping well, it can also increase our risk of having some pain, right? So sleep disturbance is associated with neck pain and long lasting sleep disturbances strengthen the association, right? So if I don't sleep well, there's a good chance I'll have neck pain. And if I don't sleep well for an even longer period of time, it increases the likelihood that I start getting neck pain. Now, I think this is really important because obviously we're trying to decrease the risk for people getting neck pain, but sleep is also really important for recovery. So one of the things I'm really trying to improve for my patients with neck pain, especially cervical radiculopathy, is their ability to sleep, okay? What's tough is that neck pain makes sleep really hard. So if we can get them in more comfortable postures, so they sleep a little bit better, right? It's probably going to help them to recover better over the course of time. And lastly, high strain from a psychological perspective, active jobs and sleep disturbances are prognostic risk factors for neck, shoulder, and arm pain. Okay. So cervical radiculopathy basically is neck, shoulder, and arm pain, right? If we're not sleeping well, or if we have a lot of stress going on in our lives, this may be one of those things that leads us or at least increase our likelihood of getting some of these neck pain problems, maybe cervical radiculopathy. Next, let's go over some anatomy that's relevant for cervical radiculopathy. The first thing you'll notice here is that this is actually a lumbar spine, okay? And I actually have a cervical spine model. It's just that the cervical spine model is pretty small, and it's hard to actually see the intervertebral foramen well. I'm going to show you on the lumbar model because I think it's a little bit easier to see, okay? So just to orient you, this is going to be a spine. This is the front of my spine. This is the back of my spine. So if we see from the side, these are the spinous processes. As we go up and down, these are the transverse processes on the side, right? This yellow stuff right here are going to be nerves exiting. And what I want you to appreciate is going to be the space right here. This is called the intervertebral foramen, right? You can see the nerve exits right in that spot, okay? Now in cervical radiculopathy, we can have an injury to the nerves exiting through a variety of means, right? So one of those is going to be a disc herniation. So if you have a posterior lateral disc herniation, so think about this disc right through here. If this has a herniation towards the back and the side, that's right where this nerve lies, okay? And a couple things. So if I compress up against that nerve, that can create some symptoms, right? But the other piece is if I break the annular wall, the outside wall here, what can happen is that the inside contents can leak outside the exudates onto this exiting nerve root, and that can create a lot of inflammation. Okay. So if you have a disc herniation, that pressure up against the nerve can create symptoms or inflammation that just occurs from the insides leaking outside. Okay. The second piece is due to degenerative changes. So if I have degenerative changes over the course of time, that can lead to radiculopathy. What I mean by that is A, a decrease in the disc height. So if my intervertebral disc is getting shorter, right, over the course of time, that actually will compress the intervertebral foramen, right? So if me, my vertebrae are getting closer together just because the disc is shrinking, that's also going to shrink the intervertebral foramen, okay? The other piece is that we can have um, decreases in space due to osteoarthritis or hypertrophy of some of the areas around the intervertebral foramen. So if the oncovertebral joints or the joints of Lushka hypertrophy, right, due to mechanical compression. So think about the spine just taking stress over the course of time, then the bone can grow a little bit and shrink the space for the nerves leaving. You can also have osteophytes or bony spurs that can grow in this area. We can also have hypertrophy of the facet joints, right? All of those things are right around the intervertebral foramen. And if that space is getting smaller, 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 you might get too much compression on that nerve. And that compression can also create some inflammation and over the course of time, pain. So if we take the spine and flip it around, you actually find the like button is right behind the spine. And you definitely want to hit that and probably subscribe to the channel as well. So now we have an image of the intervertebral foramen. We have two images, one on the left, one on the right. 
the right side is actually in the cervical spine. And I think you'll be able to see that it's, it's actually a little tough to, to visualize because it's so small right there, but I drew a circle around it and pointed right to it. Right. And then on the image on the left, we've taken one vertebrae off and you can see the intervertebral foramen and the nerve as it exits. Right. And from this position, you can see if I have a posterior lateral herniation, so a herniation that goes to the side and backwards that can press right on that nerve root. And if I do have some of the contents of the inside of the disc leaking outside, that's going to spill all over that nerve and create a bunch of pain, right? Inflammation and a, a cascade of symptoms. Next, here's another image, uh, also in the lumbar spine, but I think it's really easy to appreciate the intervertebral foramen in this image. Uh, the other image to the right that I like is a disc from the top. And what's kind of nice is you can see the nucleus propulsus, which is going to be the inside and the darker gray. Around it on the outside is annular fibrosis, excuse me, the annulus fibrosis. And a little tough to see in the images, but they actually form rings. There's a whole bunch of rings, kind of like the center of a tree. If you cut a tree in half, you can see all the rings. You've got rings of the annulus fibrosis, and they extend all the way to the outer wall, right? And if you break through all the layers of the annular wall, you obviously can have some of the inside contents leak outside, and that's associated with the a disc herniation that is non-contained. Again, these non-contained disc herniations where the insides leak outside can lead to a bunch of inflammation just because the nerve is bathed with the nucleus propulsus. And lastly, we have an image of a disc cut in half. And this is pretty nice because you can very easily visualize the annular wall and the different rings. And you can also see the intervertebral disc in this example is getting pushed a little bit out to the side. If we have too much of that over the course of time, if we break through all of those annular rings, then we can have a non-contained disc herniation eventually. The other thing to mention in this photo is going to be the facet joint. So if you have hypertrophy of the facet joint, you can see how the intervertebral foramen is going to have a little less space, right? So again, the things that can crowd out, crowd out the intervertebral foramen going to be reduction in the disc height can also be hypertrophy of the joints of Lushka. You can also have hypertrophy of the facet joints and osteophytes around the area that can grow in and compress the nerve as it exits. So what is the mechanism of injury for cervical radiculopathy? Well, we already just went over it. You can either have a herniation of the intervertebral disc. Generally speaking, this is going to be a posterior lateral herniation. It could also be disc degeneration causing decreased neuroforaminal height, right? So if I have the disc height shrinking, 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 the intervertebral foramen will also get smaller with that decrease in disc height. And lastly, cervical spondylosis is basically osteoarthritis around the intervertebral foramen, which can also crowd that nerve. And one thing I definitely want to point out, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that you can have a lot of these degenerative changes with no symptoms whatsoever. Okay. And one of the reasons why potentially is because we have a decent amount of space in that intervertebral foramen. And as things degenerate over the course of time, it may crowd the nerve a little bit, but the nerve still has plenty of space and doesn't necessarily lead to symptoms over the course of time. The prevalence of osteoarthritis in the spine, as well as disc herniations as we age is pretty dang high. And just because we have these findings doesn't mean that you're going to be destined for pain. These are normal changes. There are three main types of disc herniations that can lead to cervical radiculopathy. The first one is intraforaminal, and this makes total sense. If you have a herniation right in that space where the nerve lives, obviously that can create some symptoms. These herniations lead to predominantly sensory radicular symptoms, and they are the most common, right? So if you have cervical radiculopathy from a disc herniation, this is going to be the most common presentation. You can also have a posterior lateral disc herniation, which you just mentioned. That's the next most common, and it generally results in weakness and potentially muscle atrophy, right? So if you're losing a lot of strength, it means the muscles are affected. If we're not getting good transmission from the nerves, to the muscles, they may shrink over the course of time. And when you're doing your clinical examination, you may find some weakness. You might also find the muscles a little bit smaller left to right. Lastly, you can have midline herniations, and these are usually more rare. They tend to directly compress the spinal cord and result in symptoms of myelopathy. Okay. So a more serious condition. And this leads to upper extremity numbness, weakness, gait disturbances, ataxia, and urinary incontinence. So basically when you have a patient come through the door, you want to ask for these symptoms. 
if they have something like myelopathy present, the treatment is going to be different than cervical radiculopathy, right? So how common are disc herniations in the cervical spine? Well, I thought this was pretty interesting information, but disc herniations in the cervical spine are much less common than disc herniations in the lumbar spine. So disc herniations in the lumbar spine are going to account for the majority of lumbar radiculopathy, but in the cervical spine, they only account for about 22% of all cervical radiculopathy cases, right? So much less common for folks to have disc herniations in the neck causing radicular symptoms compared to the lumbar spine. Now we can also have some compression of the nerve leading to symptoms. And previously I said that just compression alone of the nerve isn't enough to create pain. So in studies where they go and compress a nerve within your body and see if that creates pain, it tends not to. So what the heck is going on in these patients that don't have a disc herniation, but they have compression and that leads to pain, radicular pain, right? Well, if you compress a nerve for long enough, that can lead to localized ischemia and nerve damage. So essentially the nerve is not getting oxygen and that can kill off portions of the nerve. But this compression can also trigger a pro-inflammatory cascade mediated by tumor necrosis factor, interleukin factor six, and matrix metalloproteinases. And this cascade leads to further sensitization and increased pain in the nerve, right? So if you compress the nerve, it doesn't create pain right away, but over the course of time, it creates a cascade of inflammation, which can create pain. And lastly, we can very easily get chemical irritation on the nerve. If you do have that disc herniation where the inside contents leak outside, if the exits are now in contact with that nerve root, that can create inflammation directly and create your radicular pain in your cervical radiculopathy patients. Tongue twister. I know we went over this, but cervical spondylosis can also be one of the reasons why we end up with cervical radiculopathy. So if we have these degenerative changes from aging, and that's going to be decreased disc height, as well as foraminal narrowing, this is going to increase loads to the vertebral body and the intervertebral joints of Lushka. Like I said, the oncovertebral joints leading to osteophyte formation and bony hypertrophy. Hypertrophy of the oncovertebral and facet joints can cause foraminal stenosis and cervical radiculopathy. So again, degenerative changes can also lead to cervical radiculopathy over the course of time. This is actually much more common than disc herniations. And lastly, cervical radiculopathy can also happen for a variety of other reasons. It's important to keep your eye out for. So it could be a tumor, could be trauma from, let's say, a whiplash injury, a car accident, maybe a fall, synovial cysts, meningeal cysts dural arterial venous fistulae and tortuous vertebral arteries. So when you have your patient comes through the door, you're going to rule out medical red flags. And if they have no medical red flags, you initiate treatment. And over the course of time, if they're not improving, you send them back to the physician and they may order some imaging and find some of these things. Okay. So it is important that you're trying to rule out red flags before treating these. If you're not making progress over the course of time, you can send back to the doc. They can do some imaging and figure out if there's something going on that we're missing. Another leading cause of cervical radiculopathy is not hitting the like button or subscribing to the channel, both of which are very common and can lead to a lack of knowledge over the course of time. And you could potentially kill your patients. I'm just kidding, but please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Next is talk a little bit about history and presentation. So your patient comes through the door. Maybe they have cervical radiculopathy. You basically got some information on the intake form. Not exactly sure what they're dealing with. In terms of what these folks tend to present with, the most common symptom is going to be arm pain, okay? And that's interesting because when folks have arm pain, your first thought is usually maybe there's a shoulder issue, right? Not necessarily neck. So the majority of folks that come with cervical radiculopathy, 97 to 99% of those folks typically have arm pain, right? Around 85 to 91% of these patients tend to have a sensory deficit, so dermatomal changes, right? Next, around 71 to 84% of these folks tend to have reflex deficits, and in certain nerve roots, we can measure this. Again, not all of them, potentially. Around 56 to 80% of these folks tend to have neck pain. So very interesting, right? Um, you may have some patients that have zero neck pain whatsoever and a bunch of arm pain, right? That tends to happen. Uh, around half to 80% of folks are going to have neck pain with the arm pain. But the most common symptom is not neck pain, it's, it's going to be shoulder and arm pain, right? So keep that in mind. Around 64 to 70% of these folks tend to have a motor deficit, so myotomal weakness. 37 to 52% of these folks have periscapular pain or pain around the shoulder blade. 
around 18% of these folks tend to have anterior chest pain. Can be pretty scary, right? You may want to try to rule out something like a heart attack before treating these folks, right? But keep in mind, cervical radicular pain can lead to chest pain in some folks. And lastly, around 10% of these folks present with headaches, right? So generally speaking, when people are presenting with headaches, my first thought is something like a cervicogenic headache, right? However, this really could be of neural origin and helping these folks with their neural base pain may help them with their headaches too. So I'm sure you guys know that I'm a huge fan of physical therapy. Unfortunately, a big chunk of physical therapists don't feel like they're paid enough for their level of education. According to the American Physical Therapy Association, the average physical therapist is graduating with $150,000 in debt. That's why I feel very strongly that physical therapists should have some additional ways to bolster their income. I am a really big fan of physical therapists writing strength and fitness training programs for their patients after discharge, as well as continuing with cash-based physical therapy after insurance has run out. However, once you start doing this, this is going to come with some technical issues. So how are my clients going to schedule with me? How am I going to start accepting payments? What platform should I use to show my exercises and programming? Well, I like Curve Health to solve all of these issues. Curve is essentially a one-stop shop for clinicians that are trying to extend their reach beyond their traditional clinic. It has simple scheduling. You can block out times in your calendar so that clients can effortlessly sign up and have a one-on-one -on -one session with you. Curve has secure payments. Curve will handle and automate all of your payments. They also have dynamic programming. That means they have an extensive library of exercise you can draw from for your clients. Or if you want to, you can actually take your own videos and upload that into Curve. This way, you can easily create tailored programs for each of your clients. They've also just launched a fast-growing marketplace, which is really exciting because they have people online that are looking for help, just like from folks like yourself. Through this marketplace, you can get some extra business, and these people can sign up directly with you. Honestly, Curve is the program that I wish I had as a new grad when I was in a ton of debt and was looking for ways to get a little bit extra income, and I was trying to see patients after discharge, but it was just a pain handling all the scheduling, billing, so on and so forth. If you want to learn more, check out the link in the description below. What's also pretty cool is that if you use this link, and when you sign up for the annual plan, you'll actually get 50 bucks back at you. So just for signing up for the annual plan, you make an extra 50 bucks back. In my mind, Curve is a no-brainer. Go ahead and get started. So during your subjective evaluation, what are the key points to focus in on, right? So one, we want to focus on the location and patterns of pain, paresthesia, sensory deficits, motor deficits. So essentially, what does the patient say when they come in to see you? Oftentimes, they may say like, wow, I just feel really weak in my shoulder. And I just have pain right over the top of the shoulder that extends down. I have a little bit of pain in my neck but the majority of it's kind of down into my arm, right? And automatically we're starting to think this sounds a little bit like a cervical radiculopathy case, right? Iyer et al. in 2016 went as far as saying that in most cases, cervical radiculopathy could be diagnosed based on the patient history alone, right? So basically this author thought we don't even need to do any sort of objective testing. They just tell me these symptoms and I got it, right? I know what's going on. The last piece is that these injuries can either be acute or they can be kind of chronic in nature, right? So basically they can happen all at once. So think about a car accident, right? I've had patients that drop barbells on their neck. I've had patients that are doing handstand pushups and they bang their head into the floor and they notice a lot of weakness and pain that radiates down the arm. I've also had patients have a very gradual onset of symptoms. They feel a little bit of kind of numbness tingling into their fingertips over the course of time, turns into some pain. Eventually they have a ton of pain within the arm, the neck starts hurting and it's really debilitating, right? So you may find some patients obviously pain all at once, but the other pieces can also be gradual in nature. When patients with cervical radiculopathy describe their pain, what do they usually describe their pain as? Usually they say their pain is shooting, stabbing, or electric in nature. And usually it travels distally into the affected limb. Okay. So a lot of folks will say, I have this pain that kind of radiates down, shoots into my fingers, into my thumb, right? Usually travels down the arm, classic sign of cervical radiculopathy. In terms of paresthesia and numbness, the presence of paresthesia alone had an 83% sensitivity. So you have patients that come in and they say they don't have any paresthesia. It's actually a fairly sensitive test to rule out cervical radiculopathy. The combination of paresthesia and numbness had an 88% sensitivity. So no numbness, no paresthesia. It's a good chance you don't have cervical radiculopathy. 
And lastly, we've all heard about dermatomal patterns of pain. So essentially, patients with cervical radiculopathy should have a very, excuse me, a very predictable uh, location of pain that goes down the arm based on that dermatome level that's involved, right? So keep in mind that this is not a perfect science. So in patients that are undergoing surgery for cervical radiculopathy, only about 54% of those patients actually follow the dermatomal pattern. Okay. So we like to think that when folks have cervical radiculopathy at a given level, their pain is only going to be in a very specific location. That's only the case for around 54% of patients. Okay. So take that with a grain of salt. You also might have a patient that's dealing with multi-level cervical radiculopathy. So in the same study I was just talking about, around 13% of those patients had radiculopathy coming from multiple levels. So you may actually find folks that are going to be weak in multiple myotomes. They're going to have sensory changes in multiple dermatomes. Could just be because multiple levels are involved within their spine. So why are dermatomal patterns so bad? So this is directly coming from a researcher by the name of Bogduck. So Bogduck has done a ton of research in the lumbar spine as well as the cervical spine, uh, particularly with lumbar and cervical radiculopathy, right? And one of the things that he mentioned is that we've actually run these studies where we try to aggravate a given nerve and see if that provokes pain in a typical dermatomal pattern. So what happens when you end up provoking folks in their nerves? Well, for one, yes, they did report pain going down the arm. However, the pattern of cervical pain was not dermatomal. Sensory loss was, but pain wasn't. And what Bogduck wrote was, radicular pain is perceived deeply through the shoulder girdle and into the upper limb. Radicular pain from C5 tends to remain in the arm, whereas pain from C6, C7, and C8 extends into the forearm and the hand. These patterns of distribution indicate that the pain is not restricted to cutaneous afferents. It involves afferents from deep tissues as well, such as muscles and joints. Because the segmental innervation of deep tissues is not the same as that of skin, radicular pain cannot be and is not dermatomal in distribution. Basically, what he's saying is that dermatomal patterns for pain is a bunch of BS, right? So in studies where they try to provoke nerves, it doesn't create pain in dermatomal distribution. And from this basic understanding of pain, it seems that the pain does not follow the dermatomal distribution. So of course, these numbers are going to be off in these studies when they're looking at pain in a dermatomal fashion. So going back to numbness and tingling, that distribution of numbness can predict the level by dermatomal distribution, right? However, pain is going to be more nonspecific in nature, maybe C5 more likely to be in the upper arm, whereas the lower nerve roots more in the lower forearm area into the hands, right? Typically, extension and lateral flexion can be painful for these patients. So if we extend the neck and laterally flex, as well as rotate towards the involved sign, that's going to decrease the intervertebral foramen. So if there is a nerve root injury or irritation, we're probably going to provoke it with those motions. Also, keep in mind that research from Wainer et al. in 2003, the same guy that created the Wainer cluster of tests that diagnosed cervical radiculopathy, he found that patients that had reduced cervical flexion, so less than 55 degrees of cervical flexion, had an increased likelihood of cervical radiculopathy. Basically, they found less than 55 degrees of flexion and an 89% sensitivity and a 41% specificity for ruling out or ruling in cervical radiculopathy. So at least in my mind, folks that have cervical radiculopathy, is just irritated and all motions tend to hurt. But you may find that extension, lateral flexion, and ipsilateral uh, cervical rotation may be particularly painful just because all of those motions tend to decrease the intervertebral foraminal space. Patients with cervical radiculopathy also tend to have pain on one side. This is unique to other forms of neck pain. Essentially, if you have more mechanical neck pain, axial neck pain, usually the pain is more bilateral symmetric and more central. With cervical radiculopathy, it's usually to one side and down the arm. If you guys are liking the content so far, I'd really appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to the channel. Doing this helps me make more great future content. Again, I really appreciate it. So what should the objective evaluation look like for patients that have cervical radiculopathy? Well, there's going to be four main things. After you do the objective, you probably want to take a look at manual muscle testing for myotomal weakness. We also want to see if you can visually see any atrophy in given muscle groups, because again, that's going to help us rule in a cervical radiculopathy. 
We want to look at sensory testing to take a look at dermatomal issues, right? We also want to take a look at deep tendon reflexes using your trusty old reflex hammer. And lastly, provocative tests or special tests like a spurling or an upper limb neural tension test. We're going to go in depth on all of these. So we can use myotomes to help to figure out whether or not this patient in front of us has cervical radiculopathy or not. We can also use this information, to try to rule in which level is going to be involved, right? So if people have an injury to the C5 nerve root level, we would expect to see some weakness into the deltoid as well as an elbow flexion. So if you have reduced shoulder abduction strength, and you also have reduced biceps or elbow flexion strength, we're starting to think this may be a C5 nerve, excuse me, nerve root injury. Tongue twister, sorry guys. Uh, if we have an injury to the C6 nerve root, we can expect to see a little bit of weakness in the bicep, right? So elbow flexion could be limited as well as wrist extension. Okay, so make sure you're testing those things. For C7 nerve root injuries, we expect to see a little bit of weakness of the triceps, so elbow extension, as well as wrist flexion. Injury to the C8 nerve root, you expect to see some weakness in the finger flexors or also thumb abduction. And lastly, an injury to the T1 nerve root level, we expect to see some weakness in the finger intrinsics, specifically force first dorsal interosseous weakness. Now I've actually already videoed myotomal tests as well as dermatomal tests and reflex tests, right? Uh, I will try to leave a link in the show notes in the description if they're published, but if they're not published quite yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you'll be notified about when I actually release those videos. This way you can see exactly how I like to test for myotomal weakness, dermatomal changes and reflex changes. Hong et al. in 2022 was looking at patients that were going to be undergoing surgery for cervical radiculopathy. So these patients that were about to go surgery for cervical radiculopathy had been thoroughly examined to try to figure out if the cervical nerve root was involved and which one, right? So they went through clinical testing. They probably had an MRI. They may have had some diagnostic injections to try to figure out exactly what nerve root was involved, okay? And then these patients, using myotomes, you could only correctly identify the nerve root that was involved in 67% of all the patients. Okay. So basically if I have a patient that's weak at the C5 level, I'm thinking probably the C5 nerve root, although only at least in this study, we could only be certain in around 67% of those patients, right? So again, not a perfect science. So in this study, motor weakness of C5, C6 radiculopathy, so a C6 nerve root lesion, showed much more variance with typical motor weakness demonstrated in 47% of the patients. So in this study, the assessment of C5 shoulder abduction didn't have a very good correlation with an actual injury to the C5 nerve root. Also, patients with severe motor weakness, so think about less than a three out of five, can't lift my arm up against gravity, or if they had obvious atrophy of the area, those with involvement of root C5, C7, and C8 showed a typical pattern, right? So C5, not so good. These other nerve roots, a little bit better. Only two of the six patients with severe motor weakness caused by C5, C6 radicul radiculopathy fit the typical pattern, right? So again, C6, didn't really match up well at all with severe weakness. In C6 radiculopathy patients with severe motor weakness, four of six of those patients had weakness that did not conform to the standard pattern. So not only did the weakness not fit the area, but they were weak somewhere else. They were severely weak, but not in the dermatome, or excuse me, not in the myotome that they expect to be weak. So wrap your head around that, right? But myotomes, just like dermatomes, not a perfect science. So as previously discussed in prior research from McCaney et al, about 54% of patients follow the standard dermatomal pattern. In this study by Hong, around 62% of patients were identified as having the standard dermatomal pattern. So a little bit higher, but not by much, right? And when you're assessing dermatomes, what's the best way to do this? Well, when we're looking at dermatomes, we're looking for either reduced sensation. So when we test from left side to the right side, we're looking for a reduction in sensation or heightened sensation. So this could be just brushing lightly on the side of the shoulder and the patient just experiencing, whoa, that's a lot of burning. That's an intense sensation, right? This can be assessed via pin prick testing or light touch. 
We have a bit of research to show that those are both adequate. They're both decent ways of testing your patients. So you can choose either one. And again, we're assessing side to side. A positive test would be diminished sensations or increased sensation like hyperalgesia. Like on this side, it feels like painful burning. On the other side, it just feels normal. So in terms of where these dermatomes lie, you're also going to find a lot of variety in our medical literature. You see a lot of images out there where people are kind of striped like a zebra, right? And uh, keep in mind that our dermatomal patterns aren't perfect. And what I also see is that these dermatomal maps are very different from source to source, okay? Largely, when we're assessing the C5 nerve root, we're looking for pain or sensory change in the deltoid area and the lateral side of the upper arm. Okay. When assessing the C6 nerve root or the C5, C6 level, we're looking for some pain or sensory changes in the radial forearm to the thumb and index fingers, excuse me, index fingers. When assessing the C7 level or the C6, C7 level, we should notice a mid radial forearm to index and middle finger. I think middle finger is a very easy and very consistent finding with C7 injuries, right? Across our medical literature. So looking for changes there. An injury to the C8 nerve root or the C7 T1 level should give you some ulnar form and ring and little finger sensory changes and or pain. Again, these findings are not perfect. And the other part is that we just talked, Bogduck said that pain should not follow a dermatomal pattern. So you can't always expect pain to follow that pattern. What Bogduck did not say, and he most certainly should have said, is that you should like this video as well as subscribe to the Fitness Pain Free channel. Bogduck will be very appreciative. So reflex testing is also a way you can roll in or roll out cervical radiculopathy. The other piece is that we can help to figure out which level is involved based on which reflex test we use. Unfortunately, you can't use reflex tests to test every single nerve root. There's a few key ones where we can. Uh, the first one of which is going to be the C5 nerve root. We should have changes to the biceps reflex if we have an injury to that area. For the C6 nerve root, we should see some changes in the biceps as well as a brachial radialis reflex. An injury to the C7 nerve root, you should see a change to the triceps reflex. And again, I've taken videos on how to do all the reflex testing. So just make sure you're subscribed to the channel and I'll leave a link in the description so you can check out those videos or you'll be notified when those videos come out. So again, the biceps reflex is useful for diagnosing C5 or C6 nerve root injuries. The brachial radialis reflex is useful for diagnosing C6 nerve root injuries. And the triceps reflex is going to be useful for ruling in or ruling out C7 injuries. And lastly, a positive test is going to be a diminished reflex from left side to right side, involved to uninvolved. We also have some great special tests or provocative tests in order to rule in or rule out cervical radiculopathy. The first thing I will say is that the sensitivities and specificities of these tests, and this goes for biotomes, dermatomes, and reflexes as well, they are going to be graded on a gold standard that's not always 100% accurate. What do I mean by this? So in a lot of the studies where they're looking at sensitivities and specificities, their gold standard for the presence of cervical radiculopathy is going to be an MRI or an electrophysiologic test. Okay. We know that these tests aren't perfect. And with MRIs, we know there are a lot of asymptomatic findings. So if you have an asymptomatic disc herniation, right? And that's supposed to be your gold standard for measuring these special tests. And we know that that data is going to be incorrect. All right. In some of these studies, the gold standard was in patients that were about to undergo surgery for cervical radiculopathy at a specific level. So they probably had a clinical examination, MRIs, as well as diagnostic injections to try to rule in that nerve root level. Okay. So in some studies, the sensitivities and specificities are better than others, but also keep in mind that you're going to find these tests being measured up against a gold standard that may or may not be accurate. The other thing to keep in mind is that in these special tests, a positive special test was a reproduction of the patient's radicular symptoms, right? So if I do a Sperling's test, so I extend and laterally flex, and it just feels a little bit tight within the neck, that would not be a positive special test. We need to provoke that patient's radicular symptoms. So if we do a Sperling's and we notice some numbness, some tingling, some paresthesia, pain that radiates into the arm, that would be a positive special test because it's provoking ridiculous symptoms. If there's a little central tightness just from doing this test, 
that's not positive, at least for cervical radiculopathy. So there's a bunch of good special tests to choose from, first of which would be a Sperling's test. This test had a specificity of 0.89 and a sensitivity of 0.98. So very, very good for ruling in and ruling out cervical radiculopathy. The traction distraction test had a specificity of 0.97. So very good for ruling in cervical radiculopathy, but a 33% sensitivity. So not very good for ruling the condition out. The upper limb neural tension test can obviously be done in a variety of different ways. We have tests for the median nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve, and multiple tests for the median nerve, right? Uh, the most sensitive test of the bunch was upper limb neural tension test one. And then the most specific test was the ulnar variation. Uh, if you guys want to see the upper limb neural test and tension tests in action, I will leave a link in the description for a video going over all of these tests. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So if you're going to use just one test that has high sensitivity, upper limb neural tension test one, if you want one test that has a high specificity, that's going to be upper limb neural tension test three for the ulnar nerve. Okay. When you combine all these four tests, they have a sensitivity of 97% and a specificity of 69%. So if you perform all of these tests on your patients with a suspected cervical radiculopathy, and all of these are negative, there's a really good chance that the patient in front of you does not have cervical radiculopathy. The Valsalva test had a sensitivity of 22% and a specificity of 94%. So very good at ruling in cervical radiculopathy. The shoulder abduction test had a 47% sensitivity and an 85% specificity. The squeeze test had a 97% sensitivity as well as specificity. So this is actually a really, really good special test I've never heard of before. And if you guys want to check it out, go to the link in the description. I go over this test, how to perform it. So where do x-rays fall into the mix here for cervical radiculopathy? One important thing to keep in mind is that 65% of asymptomatic patients, 50 to 59 years of age, will have radiographic evidence of significant cervical spine degeneration, regardless of radiculopathy symptoms right? We noted on this earlier, if we're relying on x-rays to figure out if someone has cervical radiculopathy, it doesn't always tell the whole tale because a lot of these findings are going to be asymptomatic, right? The other piece is that <clears throat> generally speaking, these are nerve injuries. So x-rays don't pick up soft tissue injuries here like nerves, right? So why do we care about x-rays if this is a soft tissue injury? Obviously, x-rays aren't going to pick up nerves as a diagnostic test. Well, you can see how big the intervertebral foramen is. And if there's very little space given spurring or let's say someone has um, a bony hypertrophy on the uncovertebral uh, joints, then you will see decreased space and help to kind of rule in a given level uh, based on the clinical findings as well right? So they do have a little bit of value. So when would you consider looking at an x-ray or getting some x-rays, excuse me, x-rays? Well, for one, when there are red flags apparent, right? And which red flags can you find with an x-ray? So you can find instability, right? So if you have a fracture of the neck, obviously that's something that's an emergency situation. You need to get some imaging to figure out if that's going on, right? And the other one's going to be malignancy or some sort of cancer. So x-rays can actually pick up on that as well. So if you have a patient where you suspect they may have cancer, obviously refer back to the physician and they can do some imaging at that point. The other time when you can consider getting some extra imaging, like an x-ray, would be if you had a failure of conservative treatment. So basically, if someone tries some physical therapy, has some time go by, not getting any better, let's say four to six weeks or so, we refer, excuse me, we refer back to the physician and they can order some x-rays. So the x-rays and later MRIs are going to be important because we have to figure out, A, if this person truly has radiculopathy, but the other piece is if we're going to utilize an injection, right? So epidural corticosteroid injection, or if we're considering surgery, we have to know which level is going to be involved. And x-rays are going to help with that. When is an MRI useful in the diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy? So just like with x-ray, the MRI is not helpful in most cases of cervical radiculopathy because of its significant rates of false negative and false positive findings, right? So if I have MRIs of the general population, I will find a lot of asymptomatic individuals that have disc pathology, that have decreased space in intervertebral foramen. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a problem. So it's a little tough to take the MRIs as this is the gold standard. We know this person has cervical radiculopathy. 
because we see this disc, disc pathology at C5, C6, right? So take that with a grain of salt. In asymptomatic patients over the age of 64, 57% of these folks have evidence of disc herniation and 26% have spinal cord impingement. So when would you consider ordering an MRI, okay? Generally speaking, same as x-rays, when there are red flags apparent. So if you suspect something like a myelopathy, abscess, or a patient has progressive weakness, in that case, we want to refer them back to the doctor because they may need an emergency surgery, okay? Also, if you have a failure of conservative treatment, let's say you go through four to six weeks of physical therapy, no improvement whatsoever. Okay, let's send back to the doctor. Let's order an MRI. Let's get some more information about whether or not this person actually has cervical radiculopathy. Maybe they're dealing with something else we need to be aware of and treat it a bit differently. And the other piece is where is the nerve root that's involved if this truly is cervical radiculopathy? Because if we're going to do an injection or surgery, we want to make sure we do it at the right level. What about electrodiagnostic tests? So things like EMG. When would you consider using something like an EMG? Well, for one, they actually can be useful in trying to figure out which nerve root is going to be involved. It's not a perfect test. It doesn't have 100% sensitivity and specificity, but it can be useful. The other thing that we can use is as a differential diagnosis tool when we're dealing with something like a peripheral nerve injury. So if you have some sort of entrapment syndrome a little further down the leg, so think about maybe like a piriformis syndrome versus a cervical radiculopathy, we can kind of tease out the peripheral nerve injuries with electrodiagnostic tests. So like I said, these tests are not perfect. And at least in the lumbar spine, EMG has a sensitivity of 0.5 to 0.85. So not quite perfect. We can't say, hey, EMG results are this. That means they have cervical radiculopathy. We know that's not true. So a few differential diagnoses where EMG might be helpful, carpal tunnel syndrome, that could be a median nerve injury, or it could be carpal tunnel syndrome, right? So having carpal tunnel syndrome is going to mimic a C6 or C7 injury. If someone is dealing with cubital tunnel syndrome, this could be an injury to the ulnar nerve. However, it also could be a C8 or T1 injury. We're trying to figure out, is this a radicular issue or is this more of a local issue? And the last one is posterior interosseous nerve entrapment. So basically it's an injury to the radial nerve, but not at the spine, right? And it can mimic a C7 nerve root injury. And the treatments are just going to be a little bit different, right? Think about carpal tunnel syndrome. We're probably going to brace that person. If someone has a nerve root injury, we're probably not going to put them in a, a night splint, right? So we want to make sure we're giving our patients gold standard treatments based on an accurate diagnosis. And if you are interested in giving your patients accurate diagnoses, you should like this video and subscribe to the Fitness Pain-Free channel, where I'll teach you how to diagnose all sorts of stuff, not just cervical radiculopathy. I've also included a nice little table for you. This is from American Family Physician. And it's a nice little table for differential diagnosis for you about cervical radiculopathy. It's pretty dang enormous. So I'm going to leave a link in the show notes so you guys can just take a look at this and you don't have to listen to me drone on and read this table for you. Uh, but yeah, you can have a bunch of different conditions that look like cervical radiculopathy. It's important you know how to differentiate amongst these things. Some of the heavy hitters here are going to be those peripheral nerve injuries like a carpal tunnel syndrome. You also might see some rotator cuff pathology, right? Shoulder pain. Pain, might seem a little bit necky. We want to make sure that we're dealing with a neck issue and not a shoulder issue. Could be seen some brachial plexopathy. So sometimes you get a stretch injury of the brachial plexus and the injury is not necessarily at the nerve root, but a little further down, right? So more of a peripheral injury. Another big one that often mimics um, cervical radiculopathy is going to be thoracic outlet syndrome. And a lot of these conditions just have a different set of diagnostic tests, to rule these in or rule these out. So what are some of the best treatments for cervical radiculopathy? Let's say you ruled in cervical radiculopathy with your patient. You want to treat them appropriately. What kind of stuff can you do? Well, the big one is going to be exercise, right? And largely exercise seems to be a good treatment for these folks. So Liang et al. in 2019 did a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at the effects of exercise on cervical radiculopathy. They had 10 studies, 871 participants. So as far as physical therapy studies go, that's actually pretty dang big, right? So decent study. And basically in the control group, and keep in mind, this was a systematic review of meta-analysis, so it's multiple different control groups. Uh, generally speaking, there was a, a variety of different treatments that were mostly passive. So think about massage, 
acupuncture or ultrasound, right? And they compare the control group, which is mostly passive treatments against an active intervention group, right? And these folks had some sort of exercise treatment. Uh, what's a little frustrating is I wasn't able to access all the papers to see exactly which exercises they used in the papers where I could find uh, and see those exercises. I've shared a little bit of that information for you so you can see the exact treatments you can use with your patients that have shown to be effective, right? Uh, but largely these studies in the active exercise group, they're doing some sort of exercise specific to the neck. It could be some scapular strengthening exercises, some upper extremity strengthening. So think about doing a row, pull down, a press, or some postural correction drills. So think about standing tall, shoulders kind of back and down, tucking that chin in. Okay. Those were kind of the treatments you'll see in the majority of these studies. The outcome measure in most of these studies were going to be VAS pain. So how much pain do you have on a scale of zero to 10 prior to the treatment and then after the treatment, right? Also, they were looking at outcome measures. One of the big ones they used was the neck disability index. And they saw the exercise was beneficial for these folks. And the quality of evidence for these studies is actually quite low. Okay. And this is based on the grade level of evidence. Uh, so you can have kind of a low confidence in these results. And I just kind of talked up this study being pretty beneficial, but the level of, of evidence is pretty low in general. I think what you'll find, unfortunately, for a lot of physical therapy pathologies is that the evidence we have is not very high. It's kind of small samples, not a lot of, you know, participants, um, which makes it a little bit tough to hang your hat on any one of these studies as being like a gold standard or a way that you can kind of treat your patients reliably. Um, because we don't know how accurate these results are. I'd love to see some more research in the future, but suffice to say, this is what we have at this point. So we're going to use this lower quality evidence to guide our treatments, you know, just because more evidence elsewhere doesn't exist. So one of the studies included in this meta-analysis was from Akuj Per et al. in 2009, and they were looking at acute cervical radiculopathy. So people with a recent onset of cervical radiculopathy, not folks have had this for multiple years, right? Basically, they were looking at physical therapy versus putting patients in a semi-hard collar for three to six weeks versus a wait list. So people didn't get any sort of treatment, okay? Or maybe they did. They just weren't getting some sort of structured therapy or care, okay? Now, in the short term, the physical therapy group had reductions in pain and improved disability over control. Okay. So immediately in the first four weeks or so, these folks tend to seem tended to do better compared to the control group. They also had similar improvements with the collar group over the control. So what's very interesting in this study is that if you intervene with an active exercise program for folks, or if you just gave them a cervical collar, both of those things help those patients above the control group. However, in the long term, so at the six month mark, there was no difference between all groups. Okay. Which kind of begs this question, do we need to actually intervene with these patients? Because if we just let them go over the course of six months, they seem to kind of get to the same place. Okay. So I see this argument all over social media and I get it. And I think for patients that are okay, just dealing with their symptoms, if they're not that bad, then yeah, it seems like that's actually a pretty good option. All right. However, this study does kind of lead you to make the conclusion that if your patient has a bunch of pain and you want them to get better faster, then we can intervene with some exercise or a collar. So what did the physical therapy program look like for these participants? Well, patients went to physical therapy two times a week for six weeks and their exercises, I love this exercise because they basically were like bodybuilders. Okay. Which is awesome because I love using strength training for my patients to have all sorts of pain. looks like cervical radiculopathy is no different. You can actually just do weight training and it's going to help those patients just like weight training helps with lumbar spine issues, cervical spine issues, shoulder issues, so on and so forth. seems like a phenomenal treatment, at least a good choice. Okay. It doesn't have to be the only exercise that you prescribe for your patients, but these exercises were graded, which just means they start with less weight. And over the course of time, as patients get stronger, they add more and more and more weight, right? What kind of exercises were these folks doing at physical therapy? They were doing chest press lat pull downs. They were doing rear delt flies. They were doing dumbbell overhead press, which is awesome because these patients have neck pain and they're pressing overhead with dumbbells. Pretty cool. Front raises, upright rows and trunk rotations. So honestly, it sounds like a, a beefy upper body strength day is what it sounds like with maybe a little extra emphasis on the pressing muscles, right? Which is cool because if you just strength train, do a bunch of lifts in the gym, it seems to help with this condition. 
So great. These patients were also given a home exercise program to be performed every single day. And this program was much more neck specific. They were prescribed two sets of 10 of standing and seated chin tucks, chin tuck with a head lift, chin tuck with a head lift and rotation, cervical lateral flexion and extension isometric. So basically putting their hand against their head, trying to push against their hand, not moving isometric contraction. They're given scap retractions, self resisted lateral flexion and rotation. So a lot of isometrics, a lot of chin tucks exercises on their home program days. And again, these guys had some pretty good improvements. So what's better for your patients, a more specific exercise program or a more general exercise program. Basically, if we do a bunch of exercises that are very specific to the neck versus just giving people general exercise, are we going to have the same effect? Where's the neck program going to be a little bit better? Is general exercise a little bit better? Well, Dettering et al. in 2018 attempted to solve this question for us. The name of the study was the effects of neck specific training versus prescribed physical activity on pain and disability in patients with cervical radiculopathy, a randomized control trial. Okay. So good evidence for us. One of the authors was uh, Joshua Cleland on this paper. He tends to do a really good job. I'm a big fan of his research, right? They were looking at 144 patients with cervical radiculopathy, radiculopathy, excuse me. And they were given either three months of neck specific exercises. And we're going to go in depth on what those exercises were um, and compared it to general physical activity. What I think is important is that they gave the folks in the general physical activity motivational interviewing on top of a programmed exercise, which was not given to the specific neck exercise group. So who knows, uh, maybe that has an effect on the results for both these groups. They were given a cognitive behavioral approach, right? Uh, so there is a form of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, which we know has been shown to be helpful for folks that do have pain. And they tried to use some of these strategies while helping patients in the neck specific group, as well as the general physical activity group. So the neck specific exercise program is actually a program that's been studied before, mostly in whiplash patients, right? So I have this, it's citation number 23. I'm going to leave a link for the references in the show notes. If you guys want to download and see the exact exercises, sets, reps, so on, so forth, progressions, uh, you're welcome to, right? I'm going to briefly describe it now, but if you want to apply this to your patients, you certainly could. So these patients underwent physiotherapy three times per week, and they also had a home exercise program on their off day, right? Stage one of this program has a visualized motion. So basically, if you lay on your back, you're going to visualize turning your head to the side, turning it to the other side, extending it, flexing it, all the motions, right? Except you're not actually moving your neck. So their stage one was thinking about moving, but not actually moving. Stage two actually had a little bit of motion. That was things like chin tucks, isometric flexion, and isometric rotation. In stage three, these were gym exercises. So cable resisted isometrics, inclined board isometrics for endurance. So imagine lying on inclined bench and picking up your body so that you're statically holding yourself in place. And it strains obviously your core as well as your neck, right? Band and cable resisted rotation. So essentially these patients had a cable attached to a machine, attached to a strap around their head. And when they rotated, they got a little extra resistance from the cable. Stage four in the deadering study was liking this video and subscribing to the channel. I'm just kidding. That didn't happen, but you should like the video and subscribe to the channel. The deadering group, like I said, also had a home exercise program and the home exercise program to be done on off days is going to consist of band cervical isometrics in all directions, as well as band cervical rotation. So basically you have a band against the wall. Band is held in your mouth, biting the band with your teeth, and then turning side to side, getting some resistive rotation there. And lastly, this group included a continuous physiotherapist guided behavioral approach targeting management of pain and stress, coping, educational breathing, relaxation, pacing, and ergonomics. And the reason being is that as physical therapists, we're often trying to improve a patient's ergonomics, the way they move throughout the course of the day. So it's a little bit nicer on the neck, reduces some stress there and helps people feel better. The other point is that stress has a pretty good correlation with neck pains. So they're trying to address that somehow. Again, I really like Cleland's studies just because they tend to do 
uh, program that's actually quite similar to what most patients will typically get in a physical therapy setting, right? Sometimes the studies you read, the exercise they give, it's, it's not what most physical therapists do, right? Oftentimes a physical therapist is going to try to improve a variety of different things as opposed to just blanket giving you an exercise program. Although some physical therapy facilities will give you a blanket exercise program. So what did patients in the general physical activity group get? They were given aerobic and or muscular activity. Okay. And basically the aerobic exercises, folks could walk, they could run, they could do anything that's going to get your heart rate up. Right. And in the muscular activity group, they're just strength training. Okay. And basically these programs were individualized to the patient. So if the patient kind of liked more strength training, if they like more endurance training, they would give them a program based on their individual preferences. These sessions were three times a week for 30 minutes. And they're also delivered with some motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing is a strategy to improve patients' outcomes by improving therapeutic alliance, improving rapport, right? So if we're doing this while we're delivering exercises, hopefully we improve compliance for our patients, right? Now, this was not included in the other group, although the other group obviously got a lot of cool stuff, right? But the results are pretty fascinating. In the follow-up of this study, so at 3, 6, 12, and 24 months, we were looking at outcomes of neck pain, arm pain, as well as headaches using a VAS questionnaire. We looked at NDI, Neck Disability Index, FABQ, Fear Avoidance Belief Questionnaire, European Quality of Life 5-Day. I'm not familiar with that outcome assessment, but it seems like a quality of life assessment. And then Hospital Anxiety Depression Scale. So I think this is important because neck pain can cause anxiety and depression, right? And then anxiety and depression can also correlate with pain. So it's kind of neat that we're looking at these things and kind of assessing the efficacy of the program based on them. So what were the results of this study, right? So both groups improved all aspects over the course of time. And there was no difference between groups. And this is very interesting because one group was very in-depth right? Very specific about their exercise prescription for the neck. The other group, much more general, do what you like, some sort of aerobic exercise or weight training, right? Three times a week, which is very reasonable. And they had the same outcome over the course of time. So a little sad, but it looks like if we have a very comprehensive neck specific program, it doesn't necessarily win out compared to general physical activity, right? And I think that that is frustrating to learn because I thought that the folks in this study put a lot of thought and effort into the program. Uh, but at the end of the day, just the general activity performed just as well. And although that's frustrating, I think the other part of that is that you have your options open. So if you would like to give someone a program that's very specific to the neck, that seems to really help. But the other piece is that you can also just give them physical activity and that actually seems to help just the same, right? Pretty dang cool. I think the last piece that we should consider is that there was no control group, right? And largely we know that performing exercise is usually going to be better than not performing any exercise at all. But in the long term, six months or more, the result may be just the same. So we might not have to exercise whatsoever and just let these folks kind of go, right? That's the common argument. Uh, what I will say is that short term, probably better to exercise. But they didn't include a control group where they did nothing. There was no kind of wait and see group included in this study right? And that's important to note. So was neural mobility helpful in treatment for cervical radiculopathy? So Rafiq et al. in 2022 tried to answer this question. And they were doing a comparison of neural mobilization and conservative treatment on pain, range of motion, and disability in cervical radiculopathy. This was a randomized controlled trial, which we like to see. They took patients between the age of 35 and 50, and their symptoms were two to six months in duration right? So it wasn't a very recent onset of symptoms, but it wasn't like these folks had pain for years and years and year years, excuse me, like I said, between two and six months, they were given 12 sessions total over the course of four weeks, three times per week. The follow-up was at two weeks and again at four weeks. So pretty short term in nature. Group one had a neural stretch in the upper limb neural tension test position, one set of 10 for 30 seconds. They're also given isometrics. So three sets of 10 with a five second hold in all directions. So think about lateral flexion, flexion, extension, right? Group two had no neuro mobility or no neural stretching. They just had the same exact isometrics I just said. The outcome measures were pain, 
the neck disability indirect, excuse me, index, and then range of motion. And the results found that the neural mobility group improved pain, improved the neck disability index, but had the same cervical range of motion at the two week mark, as well as the four week mark, excuse me, four week mark. The other important consideration is that both groups improved over the course of time. They didn't have a control group that did nothing. Okay. So largely we're not sure if neural mobility is better necessarily than doing nothing. Although you can make the argument that we know that exercise in the short term is better than nothing. So you can assume that the neural tension plus isometrics may be a little bit better than just isometrics alone, and maybe a little bit better than doing nothing. Should we use a cervical collar in the treatment of folks who have cervical radiculopathy? Now, this one just makes me laugh because the idea of giving someone a, cer a cervical collar seems so outdated, although we do have some research to show it can be beneficial. And Kuj Parr et al. in 2009, we already kind of reviewed that article, found the collar was as effective as exercise in the short term. However, there's no difference after six months. So if you just give folks a collar, in the first three to six weeks, right? Three weeks every day, that three to six week mark as needed, right? That's as effective as doing exercises, all right? So cervical collar or exercises, kind of your patient's choice. Tombs et al. in 2013 found low-level evidence that a collar is no more effective than physiotherapy at short-term follow-up. So basically, just like we're saying with Kuj Per, you can use a cervical collar or you could use exercise. Up to you. There's very low level evidence that a collar is no more effective than traction. So maybe you can use traction as well to be as effective. And there's low level evidence that traction is no more effective than placebo traction, right? So is using a collar as effective as a placebo, right? We're kind of jumping. This is all very low level evidence, so we can't jump to conclusions here, uh, but at least you can have a little bit of data. Overall, I generally don't use a cervical collar. I'd rather do an active approach that gets people moving, improves their health, right? And doesn't get them fe fearful of moving their neck. Is cervical traction effective as a treatment for patients with cervical radiculopathy? Young et al. in 2009 used mechanical cervical traction as part of a mixed modal treatment program of manual therapy and exercise for patients with cervical radiculopathy. And they found no significant additional benefit to pain, function, or disability in patients with cervical radiculopathy. So Fritz et al. in 2014, and this is a study that is pretty familiar to most of the students that I tend to work with regularly, found that adding mechanical traction to exercise for patients with cervical radiculopathy resulted in lower disability and pain, particularly at the lower, longer term follow-ups. So this study was actually pretty hopeful in suggesting that adding mechanical traction to your standard physical therapy program will actually give you a better longer term outcome. And then Romeo et al. in 2018, this was a systematic review meta-analysis and actually included the Young and Fritz study I just talked about previously. They stated there was some support of mechanical and manual traction for cervical radiculopathy in addition to other physical therapy procedures for pain reduction. However, there was a lesser effect on function and disability. Okay. So overall, there's mixed evidence on cervical traction. If you're going to use it, it seems like you should do it in conjunction with other things, and it may or may not give you an improvement in longer term outcomes. And if you're going to use cervical traction, you might as well like this video and subscribe to the fitness pain free channel. Is manual therapy effective in patients that have cervical radiculopathy? So Borella Andres et al in 2021 tried to answer this question. The study was manual therapy as a management of cervical radiculopathy, a systematic review. Pretty cool study. Really like this study. And they looked at 17 clinical trials over the past 10 years. It was a 2021 study. So 2011 to 2021. And they found nine high quality studies on the Pedro scale. So the Pedro scale is a system we can use to see how high quality the research study is. You probably learned this in physical therapy school. What's kind of nice is that they had some fairly high quality studies in order to figure out if manual therapy was more effective than other forms of treatment, right? And one of the takeaways with this study is that manual therapy was effective in the treatment of symptoms related to cervical radiculopathy in all studies regardless of the type of technique and the dose applied. So as you'll see in a minute, there are very different treatment strategies from a manual therapy perspective. We see all different types from manipulations to mobilizations. The dosages are all over the place and largely they all seem to help and they all seem to help similarly. So what did the manual therapy help with? It was specifically helpful for reducing pain, 
and improving disability, most of these results were in the short term. So basically immediately after the intervention was applied or up to around four weeks or so. Okay. So largely in the long term, it seems like things kind of revert back to the mean a little bit, but in the short term, it does seem to be additive. They also did not establish which manual techniques are most effective. It seems like all of these tend to improve patient symptoms, which I think is a little frustrating for students. Like what kind of technique should I use for the patient in front of me? It seems like you have a lot of choices. Manual therapies just seem to be a little additive above just doing exercise alone. And it seems to be helpful in the short term. It doesn't tend to matter too much which treatment you tend to use, although I'll go over the studies and which manual therapies they used. So Afzal et al. in 2009 was looking at patients with surgery cervical radiculopathy. In group one, these patients received manual intervertebral foraminal opening techniques, three sets of 10. Group two had manual traction. So 10 seconds on, five seconds off for 10 minutes. And group three received both of these treatments. They were given these treatments three times a week for a total of three weeks. And there was an improvement in the neck disability index, pain, range of motion, and the patient specific functional scale at three weeks for the group that received the manual therapies and the manual therapies with traction. However, there was no control group. So for the majority of studies I'm going to be talking about here, they don't have a control group that got nothing. Okay. So largely they're looking at exercise and manual therapy versus manual therapy, or as you'll see a variety of different groups, but they're not looking at a group that got nothing. And that's important to understand because we're not really sure if these interventions are necessarily better than doing nothing at all. All right. You can, however, make the argument, like I said before, exercise tends to help people above doing nothing, at least in the short term. And it seems like adding manual therapies to exercise is even better than just doing exercise alone, which is probably going to be better than doing nothing. But I would have loved to see some control groups in these studies to see if doing nothing or a sham actually improved things more so or less so, or it was the same exact result. Bukhari et al. in 2016 was looking at mechanical traction versus manual traction. And both groups included exercise and segmental mobilization. The segmental mobilizations they used was a prone PA technique. They did a five second mobilization for 10 total reps, and they did it at the C3 to C7 level. They did this three times a week for six total weeks. What they found, there's improved outcomes in both groups with mechanical traction being superior to manual therapy. Again, no control group that did nothing. Cui et al. in 2017 was also looking at manual therapy versus mechanical traction, was looking at manual therapy versus mechanical traction, which one is superior. The manual therapy group received a she style style cervical manipulation, which in the study they had some images, um, but it was hard to tell exactly what they were doing based on those images. I'll leave a link in the show notes if you guys want to check out that specific study and try to figure out what the heck that actually is. They also use some neck, back, and thoracic spine massage as well as some pressure point therapy, right? I will also say that in this, in this systematic review that's looking at all of these manual therapy studies, there wasn't a lot of soft tissue work. There wasn't a lot of massage included in this study, okay? But in this a specific study by Cui et al. They had some massage included with other things like this she style cervical manipulation, right? They received this treatment three times a week for a total of two weeks, and they had improved outcomes in both groups. However, the manual therapy group was superior to traction. Again, once we get a little further out, the VAS was similar at 10 weeks, right? So both of those groups had the same outcome at 10 weeks for VAS and the neck disability uh, outcome neck disability index outcome measure found a similar result at 22 weeks, right? So it seems like in the short term, the manual therapy strategy was more effective than traction. However, over the course of time, both groups kind of called up and they're the same. Elda Soki et al. in 2019 was looking at conventional therapy versus manual therapy. Now, what was conventional therapy? Conventional therapy by their definition was ultrasound, stretching, and strengthening, okay? The manual therapy group got the conventional therapy program of ultrasound stretching and strengthening, but they're also giving PA glides, 10 repetitions of 30 seconds, and oscillatory rotation movements at C6, C7, 10 sets of 30 seconds. They performed this three times a week for four weeks, and there were improved outcomes in both groups. 
the manual therapy group was superior to the conventional group, right? And this was at the end of the session. So essentially when they finished the session, they checked these outcome measures. Was it better in one group versus the other? Yes, it was in the manual therapy group. And then again, at four weeks, was the manual therapy group better than the conventional? And again, it was, right? So this is kind of an interesting study that compares manual therapy and exercise versus exercise alone. And it does appear, at least in the short term, about the four weeks, that manual therapy was superior. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the studies because it's going to take way too long, but I want you to know which manual therapy techniques they utilized that were superior to exercise alone. So Hassan et al. in 2020 found some benefit of using Maitland oscillatory mobilizations. They use three sets of 15 repetitions. Ibrahim et al. in 2019 was looking at conventional therapy versus conventional therapy plus neural glides and neural tensioners, right? And the type of glide or slider they used was an upper limb neural tension test position, slider, and stretch. They combined a glide and a tensioner. And they used one to two sets of 10 repetitions and actually found no difference between groups, which was a little sad because I actually really like to use neural glides in my treatment program. And this study showed there was no difference between the conventional therapy and adding the neural mobilizations. Kim et al. in 2017 was looking at traction versus traction plus nerve glides. So they were doing a technique where they pulled the head into some distraction and then apply a neural glide. And they found the neural glide was actually superior to the traction alone group. Kumar et al. in 2010 was looking at McKenzie versus neural mobilizations versus traction and diathermy. And what they found is that McKenzie had the best outcomes followed by traction, followed by neural mobilizations. And again, kind of sad because it seems like these, these neural techniques that I like to use are maybe not as powerful as some of the other manual therapy techniques, right? And in terms of how they utilize McKenzie, it sounds a bit like they perform McKenzie just how it's classically taught. So they're looking for a mechanical derangement identification, a direction of preference, and then prescribe manual therapy based on that direction of preference they found in the initial evaluation. The other part is that all groups had a significant improvement. It's just that McKenzie was on the top. Okay. Langevin et al. in 2014 was looking at mobilizations to increase the intervertebral foraminal space versus cervical mobilizations just to increase cervical range of motion. So one group got specific exercises to try to open up the intervertebral space, and the other group just got mobilizations in all directions trying to improve range of motion. So the mobilizations to improve space were a lateral glide, a rotation mobilization, an anterior superior lateral glide with a posterior inferior medial glide and unilateral PA added to the range of motion group. And they found the same exact outcome, which at least to me shows that when someone has a cervical radiculopathy, we don't need to give mobilizations just to open up that intervertebral foramen. We can just focus on range of motion in the entire neck and have the same outcome. So despite the range of motion not being that important in terms of which specific direction to go towards, I still think it's super important that you go towards the direction of the like button and hit that, as well as towards the direction of subscription and subscribe to the Fitness Pain Free channel. Ojo, Ojo Awo et al. in 2016 and again in 2018 found a transverse oscillatory pressure, which is a Maitland strategy towards the painful side was helpful for folks with cervical radiculopathy. Shafiq et al. in 2019 found that a mulligan spinal mobilization with arm movement was effective for cervical radiculopathy. Wakas et al. in 2016 found that a thoracic manipulation was actually better than a cervical mobilization, although both in group groups improved over the course of time. And then Young et al. in 2019 also found that thoracic spine manipulation to be effective for patients with cervical radiculopathy. The Young study actually included a placebo, which is kind of nice to see. So a sham thoracic manipulation doesn't work as well as an actual thoracic manipulation. So should we consider oral medications in the treatment of our patients with cervical radicul radiculopathy? Well, as a physical therapist, this is not my domain at all. However, what you will find for a lot of these folks, they feel god awful after the onset of cervical radiculopathy. So can we send them back to the doctor and get them on, let's say some pain meds to help with that pain in the short term. So Gassemi et al in 2013 found that a short course of oral corticosteroids reduced radiculopathy related pain in the short term. 
which is sometimes exactly what you need it for to get over that hump where things feel actually absolutely terrible. So it might be a consideration your patients that are very, very painful. Obviously, you just refer out to a physician who can do this. Just keep in mind in the long term, you're probably going to have the same outcome. So you don't need to push NSAIDs on your patients either. When should you consider corticosteroid injections in your patients with cervical radiculopathy? Largely, steroids can be considered after four to six weeks of failed conservative treatment. A 2007 Cochrane review supported the use of epidural steroid injections in patients with cervical radiculopathy. However, this was low quality evidence. Dewan et al. in 2012, via a systematic review, found good quality evidence to, to support steroid injections for cervical radiculopathy caused by a disc herniation. However, there's only fair evidence for radiculopathy caused by spondylosis. So if you have a patient that has more of the degenerative symptoms, they may not do as well with an injection. If you have a patient that has an acute cervical uh, radiculopathy due to disc herniation, they may do a bit better with a corticosteroid injection. Stav et al. found a significant benefit in pain and function with epidural steroid injections for at least one year in patients who had not improved with physical therapy and NSAIDs. So if you have a patient that's really far out from the onset of their cervical radiculopathy one year or more, they can still have an improvement via using a corticosteroid injection. The thought being is that if this pain has been lingering for so long, surely it can't be an inflammatory condition, but it does seem that, like I said before, mechanical compression for a long period of time will stimulate this cascade of inflammation and a corticosteroid injection seems to be useful even if it's a year out from the initial onset. There are some potential complications of a corticosteroid injection, and it's just important your patients know this. Uh, hopefully, the physician that you refer to will communicate this with patients, right? The potential complications that can occur are a dural puncture, meningitis, epidural abscesses, and a nerve root injury. Obviously, none of these are a good thing, so it's important the doctor just discusses the pros and cons of the injection before prescribing it to the patient. Because over the course of time, we know with just, uh, just a little bit of time or a little bit of exercise or some manual therapy tends to make these things better. You don't necessarily have to do the injection to get some improvement, but if they're not making progress over the course of time, it might be useful to refer to the physician to get some extra treatments. When should you consider surgery in your patients that have cervical radiculopathy? Well, largely surgery is going to be saved for folks that fail conservative treatment. So if you spend weeks and weeks and months and months, and you're not making any progress whatsoever, you can send back to the physician and they can discuss the possibility of a surgery. Okay. These surgeries tend to have satisfactory outcomes, and there are a lot of different surgeries that a surgeon can do for cervical radiculopathy. I'm going to name off a few for you. Anterior cervical discotomy with autologous bone graft anterior cervical discectomy with allograft bone graft plus plating, anterior cervical discectomy, anterior cervical discectomy with fusion. This is actually the most common surgery you'll see. Anterior cervical discectomy with fusion and additional plating, anterior cervical foraminotomy, cervical disc replacement, posterior or cervical foraminotomy, anterior cervical discectomy with polymethyl methacrylate PMMA. So I'm not going to go in depth on these different procedures just because that would take forever. And I'm definitely not an expert on those, but just keep in mind, there are a lot of options for the physician. Okay. In terms of which surgery is going to be most effective, Gao et al. in 2021 actually found that of all of these surgeries, they all have similar positive outcomes. And what that means is that you may have one surgeon may prescribe one technique, another surgeon may prescribe another what technique they use is going to vary a lot on what type of injury you have within the neck. Is it more of a intervertebral foraminal issue? Is it more of a disc issue, right? The surgeon can choose which surgery is going to be most effective and whichever surgery they're most comfortable with. A study in 2023 from El Masi et al. found that different variations of disc replacement were actually more effective than other forms of surgery, uh, most commonly the ACDF, as I mentioned previously. And they had mentioned the Moby C and the Kineflex were superior to other surgeries. And this is a specific type of disc replacement procedure. So what's going to be more effective, surgery or physical therapy? So Enquist et al. in 2013 attempt to answer this question. They were looking at patients from the age of 18 to 65. 
And these patients had cervical radiculopathy, somewhere between eight weeks to five years of symptoms. So pretty chronic symptoms in some of these folks. The one group was given an anterior cervical discectomy, the ACDF, with physical therapy versus physical therapy alone. So surgery plus physical therapy versus physical therapy. And what they found is that both groups improved over the study length, which is one year. And the surgical group outperformed physical therapy in neck pain and global assessment of improvement. However, once they got to the two-year mark, there was no difference in those outcomes. What's interesting is that they follow these patients up a little bit later between the, the uh, timeline of five years and eight years out from the onset of the study and actually found that the surgical group was superior for pain and the neck disability index. So interesting to see that at the one year mark, surgery was better. Two years, it was the same. Five to eight years it actually seemed like surgery was superior. The non-surgical treatment group received exercise in a step fashion. Step one had neck-specific exercises and procedures for pain relief. Step two involved general exercise, so thinking more about walking or weight training. Uh, step three involved pain coping, increasing self-efficacy, and stress management strategies because we know these things can be related to neck pain. Uh, the parameters were to perform these daily at home. Patients also perform these twice per week in the clinic. And they continue this for a minimum of three months. And really my recommendation is if you have surgical radiculopathy and you want to avoid pain, you should probably just hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Definitely going to help. Not really. So what should be your treatment plan if you have a patient that comes in with cervical radiculopathy fresh off from an injury? So step one, immediately after that initial injury, they're probably going to see a primary care physician or the emergency room, and they want to rule out medical red flags. And they also want to provide that patient some education about the injury and the prognosis, basically that this tends to get better over the course of time. All right, don't freak out. That's important for patients to know. If they have severe weakness, obviously they need to be sent to a surgeon for a surgery consult. You want to see that patient again in one to two weeks to assess for advancing neurological deficits. So sometimes that's you as a physical therapist, but oftentimes that should be a primary care physician or that first point of contact which means you have to assess their strength. And it's good to get some, some good objective measures to compare from week to week and make sure people are not getting worse. If they have progressive weakness, they need a surgeon consult and probably an emergency surgery. If the patient saw a primary care physician and that they're at the three week mark and things are not getting better, you should probably refer to physical therapy at that point. If you're already seeing that patient, just continue treating them. If pain is persisting greater than six weeks out, you can consider referring back to the physician. At this point, they may consider using an injection to reduce pain. If pain is persisting for three or more months, you may want to send to a surgeon and they can potentially look at surgical options. Just keep in mind that for patients with surgical radiculopathy, it takes a long period of time for these patients to feel better. We looked at some of those prior studies that two, three years out, people are still improving with conservative measures. So if you're sending someone out the three month mark, that might be a little bit premature. Okay. So as long as folks don't have severe weakness or any medical red flags, you might want to consider treating them conservatively for a longer period of time. However, if things really aren't getting better, then definitely I recommend sending out to a physician for potential injections or a surgical consult. Lastly, one in five patients who underwent injection ended up getting surgery over the course of five years. So if you have a patient that's not doing well, we don't have to push them straight to surgery. We can utilize an injection and it looks like most of those folks get better with injection. Only a couple end up going on to surgery. So now that you know more about cervical radiculopathy, you still need to know how to do all the special tests to rule in or rule out this condition. I have a great video for you. I'll leave a link in the corner right over there. Click on that and continue the learning. I'll see you on that next video. If you're interested in the references, I'll leave them in the description in the show notes. You can definitely check those out. Lastly, I just want to say thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button. If you leave a comment, it helps the algorithm. I'd also love to know your thoughts on this presentation today. Please subscribe to the channel. It helps me out tremendously. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please consider leaving me a positive review. Again, it helps tremendously. If you want to see more content like this in the future, we got to make sure we grow this over the course of time, right? And lastly, if you want to support me even further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain Free Insiders. This is going to be my premium subscription membership to Fitness Pain Free, where all my best content updated monthly uh, lives. 
So head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library, just $1 for a week trial. Also leave a link in the show notes in the description. All right, go ahead and check it out.